The Bullard's Brewery estate plans held at the Norfolk Record Office record the Bullard's estate from the late 19th to the early 20th century. Think brewery, think beer. But whilst the majority of these plans include a pub, some have no pub at all, and where there is a pub, there is usually so much more besides. We all know that a pub is not just a place to drink, but a place that brings people together. And where you have people, you have stories. So let's begin looking at the stories around these exquisitely drawn plans. Just about everyone drank beer in the 19th century. It was generally safer to drink than water, and many brewed beer at home. From this common practice emerged the breweries. Melville's Norwich Directory 1856 lists 19 different brewers in the city. Some well known, for example, Bullard, Stewart and Patterson's, others less so, such as Mealing and Mills. Richard Bullard founded the Anchor Brewery with James Watts. Bullard took on the Anchor name when the Anchor Brewery on Barrack Street was renamed the Pockthorpe Brewery. Bullard's partnership with Watts was dissolved after 10 years. When Bullard died, his sons took over the business. In the 1880s, surveyor Walter Frederick Brown was commissioned to draw the plans of Bullard's estate. In 1895, the brewery was registered as a limited company. By this time, its estate was large and it certainly contributed to the famous saying that Norwich had a pub for every day of the year. Richard Bullard had humble beginnings. He was the son of a waterman and lived in Waterman's Yard off Westwick Street. The famous Anchor Brewery would eventually be situated by St Miles Bridge opposite St Lawrence Church. Sons Harry, Charlie and Fred joined the business and took over when their father died. Harry became chairman of the brewery. He was a well-known and respected civil figure. He was a sheriff, a lord mayor and a magistrate and was knighted by Queen Victoria. He lived at the lodge East Carlton, then at Helsden House, Mill Lane in Helsden. Less is known of Charlie and Fred, although they were clearly key figures in the business. Charlie lived at Highham Grove and died at the early age of 31. Fred lived in Catton. The family business continued with their descendants. Harry's great-grandson Gerald was chairman by 1950 and later became chairman of Watney Man, East Anglia until he retired in 1974. The eight volumes of plans date from the late 1870s to 1914, covering their estates across Norfolk, Suffolk and one in Essex. All save a few in the final volume are by Walter Frederick Brown, a Norwich surveyor and lithographer, who lived in Higham very close to Charlie Bullard. Two of the volumes are assigned to specific names but remained part of Bullard's estate. John Boyce married Richard Bullard's daughter Emma and became part of the family business. Volume 5, The Reef and Brewery Estates, included properties linked to Stewart and Patterson's, Crawshay and Young's and Watney Mann. Most properties are inns, taverns or hotels. An inn or tavern usually meant that food and accommodation was available. Inns were usually along highway routes, with stabling available for horses. The word public house or pub never appears, but I'll use the word pub today. We can look at these plans on two different levels. We see what is in front of us, the name of the pub, its place, its location and what other buildings are part of the estate. Here, with the Honest Lawyer Tavern in Kings Lynn, we see the pub on the corner the ground floor accommodation, the painters and glaziers shop, and we know the name of the neighbour, Mrs Hutton. We can also look at the plan on a different level. Note the window which states, Window on Sufferance. Were Mrs Hutton and the licensee on good terms? Its location is on a key corner of a busy Kings Lynn Road. Who worked at the pub? Who worked in the shop? Why is the pub sign like that? Linking in with the Norfolk Pubs website, trade directories and all the other resources available to us, we can fill in the backstory to many of these stories. 
There is an endless variety of pub names. We walk past pubs on a daily basis, and many have names that are self-explanatory, but some make you think, why is it called that? Or who was he or she? Names ending in arms often reflected an allegiance to a local dignitary or place. Also, many soldiers leaving the army became publicans and would often name their pub after a commander they had admired. The Pitt Arms in Burnham Market was renamed the Host Arms in 1811 in recognition of Captain Sir William Host, who served under Lord Nelson and was one time owner of the Sandringham estate. Looking at this photo, the Host Arms is certainly a little bit more well to do today. By contrast, the Paul Pry Tavern on Grapes Hill, Norwich, was named after a fictitious character in a 19th century farce. The main character, Paul Pry, was said to be comical, idle, meddlesome and mischievous. To be a Paul Pry is to be a nosy person. An appropriate name then for a pub which would have been a rich source of gossip. And note that this photo was taken before the pub was owned by Bullards. Several pubs changed names over the years. What is now the Pear Tree on Unthank Road was originally called the Jolly Gardeners. When the initial licence was applied for by Israel Blythe in 1861, it was refused three times following petitions by local residents, but a licence was finally granted in 1864. The same thing happened with Tesco's a few years ago, which now stands opposite. The Jolly Gardeners became the Park Tavern and then the Lily Langtree. More names followed in quick succession. By comparing the plan with the photos from Picture Norfolk, we can see that the pub was extended to take up the corner plot owned by Mr John Hardy. You can see the change in the roof line. The other neighbour was widower Mary Barley, who lived in Carmel Cottage and had herself been a publican, running a licensed victuals at number five Bridal Alley with her husband Christopher. Many pubs have names and an association with a profession or trade. At the Horseshoe Inn, Hingham, you could enjoy a pint while your horse was being shooed next door and then collect some sausages from the butcher shop to take home for tea. Location and layout were very much determined by local geography, need and how the pub and its ownership had evolved over time. For many had been pubs long before they were acquired by Bullards. Most pubs can be divided into two types of location. Those on a busy main thoroughfare, catching passing travellers and those on a corner plot. Many corner pubs evolved with the expansion of the city in the 19th century. They may be tucked away from the general public's eye, but they were well known and frequented by its immediate local community. So here we have the Crown Inn at Ashill on the main road between Swaffham and Watton, right in the centre of the village, opposite the village green. And here we have the Garden House Inn on the corner of Denby and Garden Road in the heart of the 19th century terraced housing in the city, still very popular today. Some pubs were just in the wrong place. They either fell by the wayside or were improved in the name of progress. The Victoria Inn, also known as the Victoria Porter Vaults, was remodelled due to road widening on Lower Westwick Street. The Bishop Bridge Tavern, aptly named, was demolished as part of a road widening scheme along Thorpe Road and closed in 1959. And the Orford Arms Tavern at the bottom of Orford Hill and on the corner of Red Lion Street was also demolished. The original Orford Arms was demolished for road widening and the installation of the tram system in the early 1900s. It was replaced with the anchor buildings. The Orford Arms saw many licensees come and go over the years. Perhaps one to note was James Lander, who died in 1942 having reputedly jumped out of a window. It was a popular music venue in the 1960s and Jimi Hendrix played here in 1967. Another good reason to jump out of a window, perhaps. Bullard's estates and its pubs varied hugely in size and layout. 
the Vine Tavern in Dove Street was wrongly written as the Wine Tavern on the plan. It has one of the most compact sites of all and is the smallest pub in the city. By contrast, the plot of the Bull Inn at Aylsham was long and thin. The inn was closed following the licensing sessions in 1906 when it was reported that all the inns in Aylsham were well managed, except for the Bull. While the Green Dragon at Harleston had a split site, it was in a prominent position but had its stabling further down the street leading to the railway station. It was the only pub in Harleston owned by Bullards and closed in 1910. With crowded living conditions, the pub offered not only a place to drink, but it was warm and a place to socialise and enjoy other activities. Many pubs provided leisure amenities such as skittle grounds, bowling greens, club rooms, bagatelle rooms and gardens. The White Horse Inn at Great Hobbis boasted a skittle ground, a club room, a summer house and a bowling green, part of which was washed away in the 1912 floods. The boxes were where people could sit out and eat food, a good idea for our current Covid times. Note how the sty and the privy led directly into the water course leading to the river. The Mitre Tavern on Earlham Road boasted large pleasure gardens. Its links with the Bullards family are interesting. Originally a private house, Mitre Cottage was owned by John Norgate, a grocer and wine merchant with premises on St Stephen's and The Walk. Norgate lived in Curfew Cottage next door. In 1859, Norgate sold Mitre Cottage for £750 to Elijah Cole. Cole had run the Wheatsheaf pub on Castle Meadow. There were allegations that he had run the pub as a brothel, which he denied, stating the girls were seamstresses. Its licence was renewed only on condition that Cole left. So Cole took out a large mortgage and moved to the Mitre. He wanted to run the Mitre cottage as a pub, but faced local opposition. The parish were already unhappy with her strivers leaving Earlham Cemetery and going to the nearest pub until the funeral was over. Cole's application for spirit licences were repeatedly refused and so he ran the Mitre as a beer house. Bullards acquired the pub in 1886 after Cole's death. Ownership had gone almost full circle because two of Norgate's sons, Edward and John, married two of Richard Bullard's daughters, Rachel and Ellen. The original Gothic house was demolished in the 1930s and the mock Tudor one built in its place. Today it is owned and run by St Thomas's Church. On the 27th of April 1942, Norwich suffered a vicious air raid. It was inevitable that some of the pubs would be hit. Some were badly damaged but survived, like the Oakshades Tavern on Lower Goat Lane. What I find intriguing is the old church tower shown on the plan. Which church was this? And rather ironically, given its name, the Anchor of Hope on Oak Street was totally destroyed in the bombing raid. Some of Bullard's estate were residential properties. This is Regency House on the corner of Duke Street and Colgate. It was originally owned by William Hanks, a maltster and merchant, who was Lord Mayor in Norwich in 1816. It passed on to George Colby in 1821, then was occupied by Sturley Payne, a physician and surgeon. While Payne was living there, the house was recorded as Queen Anne House. It was bought by Harry and Charlie Bullard in 1866 for £500. It was home to Walter Richard Lestrange and his wife Matilda. Walter was the son of a waterman and Matilda was Richard Bullard's sister. The two families had probably known each other all their lives. Walter became a brewer at Bullard's. His eldest son took over the house when Walter died in 1886. Then it was lived in by Charlie Huon Bullard son of Charlie Bullard until 1895. Charlie Huon moved to Newmarket Road in 1895 and the house left the family. Another residential property is the Beaches, the home of John Boyce 
who married Richard Bullard's eldest child, Emma. The Beaches stands next door to the plantation garden on Earlham Road, sadly a place that has not done well for itself in recent years. The plans for another house at Catton were removed from Book 4 before the plans were acquired by the Norfolk Record Office. This may be because Fred Bullard lived at Catton and were the plans of his own home. Not all of their residential properties were grand affairs. This is a plan of the Vine Cottages estate in Beehive Inn Yard, and the photo is courtesy of George Plunkett. It adds some sense of reality to the living conditions for many people in Norwich in the 19th century. Another very different plan is that of the Empire Music Hall at 18 Lower Goat Lane. I had not heard of this before. In 1865, it was the Excise Tavern and East of England Music Hall, also known as Mackney's Music Hall. Charles Mackney had run the Exmouth Tavern and Concert Room on St Stephen's, which in 1856 was described as disgraceful a house as any in the city. Mackney protested vigorously. His livelihood was obtained, he said, by perseverance, hard work, playing musical instruments and singing. But the Exmouth Tavern was closed, so Mackney moved to Lower Goat Lane. The music hall continued at least until 1883 and was listed as the East of England Music Hall. Bullards acquired the site in 1897 and Percy Lestrange, great nephew of Richard Bullard, was its first licensee. Bullards did not renew the licence for music and singing and it reopened in December 1902 as the new Theatre Stores Public House. The main entrance switched from Lower Goat Lane to the old emergency exit for the music hall on Upper Goat Lane. The pub continued until 1939. Its last licensee was Douglas Baker, who became a brewery manager and chief wartime warden for the brewery. In the final volume of plans, there is a noticeable change in style after Brown, the surveyor, retired. Nicholson's plan of the two friends in at Blowfield is sparse and to the point almost childlike. Judging by the Norfolk pub's website, its name was very apt, as it appeared to have suffered no misdemeanours or licence infringements over its history. Morgan and Buckingham's plan of the Phoenix Hotel in Dover Court near Harwich is interesting on two counts. It is the only plan of property in Essex and the only one to show a front elevation. The original hotel was destroyed by fire in 1914. There were various theories as to the cause of the fire, which even included possible action of suffragettes, but it was concluded it was due to burning rubbish. The plans here are of the rebuild. Note the German Ocean. It met its demise in 2003 and was demolished. Let's reflect on Richard Bullard. Here was a man who went from living in Waterman's Yard to his house at 49 St Giles Street. By 1914, Richard Bullard's legacy was 259 estates, each one usually having many properties within it. His descendants took the business forward and many of these properties, while no longer owned by Bullard's today, contribute to the architectural heritage we continue to enjoy and appreciate. So many plans with so many different stories behind them. The last thing I want to share with you is the Rose Cottage Tavern at Wendling, the only plan which includes a school. Charles Carter was the licensee between 1875 and 1883. His daughter Susie Carter was a monitor at the school next door. Susie Carter's name also appears in the Norfolk Schools Survey for 1903 held at the Norfolk Record Office and a nurse in the nurses registers also held at the Norfolk Record Office gave her home address as the house once owned by Bullards on Duke Street. Two perfect examples of how these records do not stand alone. Enjoy these plans for what they are, but they also interconnect with many other records. They can lead you in many different directions, some planned and many unexpected. Thank you for listening.